<laughs> thanks Hi, for Carolyn. meeting with me. Um, and thanks for being here. I, I wanted to ask you some questions about using music scores for uh, research and some of your experience, but I'm wondering if you can introduce yourself and tell tell me a little bit about your background and your role. My name is Tim Neufeld. I'm, a, I'm an instruction librarian at the University of Toronto Music Library. My background is in musicology, well before that piano performance. I did, um, yeah, I did performance and I did uh, musicology. I did my MA and PhD at U of T in early 18th century opera. And then I went to um, library school. And I, the reason I went to library school is because I loved the research process more than I liked writing papers. So, um, and I've been, um, my role as an instruction librarian is to come into classrooms and work with students and help them uh, with their research projects and help them navigate the information landscape which as we know, gets crazier every day and more so during COVID, I think it's been a crazy year. It really has. And and you're an instructor uh, sometimes with the music department there too, right? Yeah, I'm also adjunct professor. So I teach in a research methods class for our uh, graduate students, our MA and PH, our MA students in uh, musicology and ethno, uh, ethnomusicology and theory. And I teach um, arts and science music courses uh, most recently one on the age of Bach and Handel. The, uh, about a year ago, as trying to as we transitioned from in class to the to the COVID online world, that was a part of my life. So an added challenge. Totally, that was uh, crazy. <laughs> when it was all new, I was still learning Blackboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I'd be like, now it's whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no problem. Well, yeah. So I wanted to focus our conversation on uh, music scores because I think sometimes they get overlooked as a uh, source of information because uh, people primarily think of them as a performance tool, which of course they are. Um, so yeah, I'm just wondering in your own experience, what kind of music scores you end up using for research purposes and how you go about deciding to use a score for research or for um, study? Yeah, great question. The, uh, the scores are are such a wide range of opportunities for research as well as uh, confusion. I, I like to, I think the uh, when I'm talking to students about what kind of uh, scores to go for, the I usually first of all steer them to critical editions. And I used to be a little bit more of an evangelist about selling critical editions as being the most important qualities, and I think they still are for research purposes. I think they're still your best bet, really. And, and the reason for that is because they're put together by uh, scholars who are intimately familiar with the music that, uh, that they're editing. They uh, put together a scholarly apparatus so that you can trace what changes they have made to the edition, if any. Um, they'll have an introductory essay, which is gold for undergrads um, when you're looking for research on a particular piece, because they've taken the time to talk about that particular piece and how it usually sits within the larger collection of works by the composer and the time. And I think that's a it's a it's a treasure trove of information. Um, and they usually have um, copies of um, some facsimile pages of the original manuscript or holograph, as we sometimes call it, um, embedded in it too. So you can actually see the original object, which I know in the online world doesn't seem like a big deal anymore. But what you can do is uh, compare that also to the actual score that they produced. And you can compare to com compare what they've done with how it looks on the page and, and really get a sense for the value of what they've done or added value, I think. And um, mm -hmm. so I really, I really, I really weigh them heavily as, as a great place for, for learning about the music and doing research, especially for research essays. Mm -hmm. I think they're really good for uh, the people doing theory analysis too, I think, because then uh, they really give you a, a more of a solid grounding of what you're looking at and how it, uh, whether it is been reconstructed in some ways, especially certain composers, uh, works have been heavily reconstructed to get a sense of what a piece might have been like. And if you're just going on a, um, a more recent or maybe less scholarly edition, more of a performing edition, you're not necessarily going to know what's been reconstructed and what is the original. And so you really want to, that's where those critical editions really shine, I like to think. Yeah, I think sometimes we forget that a, that a piece of music, sometimes we just have fragments of the original work or we have different sketches and the, the final version that you might see in a performing edition didn't necessarily arrive like that from the composer. So there's a lot of thought that goes into, you know, choosing, you know, the sketches and how to interpret them. Totally. 
And I think there's other important information that, that um, comes out. And this came out from my course last year uh, when I was doing the Age of Bach and Handel. Uh, I had people wanting to write an essay on Albinoni's Adagio. And if you, you can Google that uh, for interest. Uh, so uh, for those not familiar, Albinoni is a famous Baroque composer who, uh, and there's this particular piece called Adagio in G minor that you'll find all over YouTube attributed to, attributed attributed to Albinoni. And the backstory is, is there's a, there's an Italian musicologist, uh, Remy, yeah, Remo, Remo Gazzotto, I just checked my right, Gazzotto, get Giazzotto, Giazzotto, <laughs> anyways, uh, who claimed to have found a, a fragment of a piece, an adagio by Albinoni in a German uh, archive and has kind of published it under that name as Albinoni's adagio, but no such fragment existed. This was purely a piece of, 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 of fancy done by this particular person that gave him quite a bit of fame and money. Wow. Um, and he's not alone doing that. I mean, um, composers passed Mozart pieces off as their own or, uh, or attributed to Mozart and Handel likewise. So, mm -hmm. and then earlier in this last 20th century and the 19th century, misattributions were quite common too, I think. So uh, people I assume things were by Handel or by Haydn or by Mozart that simply weren't, that were um, erroneous. Um, and so one of the values of a critical edition, especially a modern critical edition, is going to clarify really if a piece is by or isn't by, which an older mm -hmm. edition. Um, and certainly IMSLP isn't always necessarily the cleanest on that information either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's so fascinating. Um, things are not always what they seem, right? Rarely. Um, how do you consider scores to be most useful in uh, in your own work or in helping others? That's a great question. I, I think they largely or historically have formed the basis of people's research of understanding of what a piece is about. And I, and I say that because um, in the last, there's been a big shift in the last two decades, especially, but uh, for the good part of the 20th century, there was really a, a hard push in musicology to understand what the composer's true attentions were on a given piece. And, and there was a real emphasis on this idea that uh, somehow there's going to be the composer's last attempt at revising a particular piece of music was really the most important. And that's the one that was needed to be saved and every other revision before that was really not worth worth keeping. And uh, that certainly shifted um, in, in the last 20 years. So the idea of an urtext is you know, this composer's original attention idea. And um, and we've seen kind of a pushback in the last 20 years or so on that idea that first of all, it's not always about the composer or um, their intentions and the fact that the, their intentions were valid at equal steps along the way. So provisions simply mean a change of ideas, not necessarily an improvement, a Darwinian improvement upon upon what came uh, before. And, and I think there's also been a kind of a reality check on when a composer writes a piece of music really before 1700, the really they weren't expected to follow it exactly. It was written anyways. It mm. was more of an outline sketch and uh, where it's is only really kind of in this kind of, we get into this later half of the 18th century, especially where, where we start to lock in this idea of a composer's true intentions, um, kind of with the uh, uh, Bach obviously, but also the Mozart Beethoven um, ideology that that's kind of what they they, they mean. Um, so having said that, compose, uh, these, these critical editions, I think, still play a vital role in understanding what's going on. But I think we see a shift away from pretending that we can somehow magically divine what their original intentions are and more trying to represent more the range of opportunity that they give and, their, and the ideas that, that come out in the scores. And I think we also see a change in the way the critical notes play, where they used to be much more about the music and um, the piece and they still are but now i think the whole social political context is exploded and that's and the scores really um include that information they're seen as a reflection of their uh social political con construct if i can use that mm -hmm. word. and of course there's all sorts of considerations to take in when you're using scores for study or for research could you talk about some of those yeah i think uh, the language one is an interesting one and again i think this is another thing that i've experienced in my lifetime is that it used to be the um especially with the traditional canon of, of western classical music that german was the language and most of the big uh scores and the critical notes and indeed if you look at a lot of the pu traditional published critical editions a lot of them are in german first the um in the last again the last 40 years really well maybe some of the 80s onwards i guess that's 40 years still that uh, we see 
uh, musicology in North America has kind of exploded in terms of its output. And as a result of that, um, a, at least at the undergrad level and um, to a certain extent at the master's level too, you can, the English language sources are, are perfectly acceptable, I think, where a lot of the critical notes now we're seeing are, are at least include the English equivalent, if not taking the lead in, in some of the English editions. The, um, the Beethoven, Verica, uh, Beethoven works cycle uh, comes to mind particularly because the actual collected critical edition is behind and what's being published for commercial use now. Mm. So we can we yeah. can actually see that they are um, and, and and they have the English critical notes. So I think language is one of those things that's been changing. Um, if you have a lesser known composer um, that you're interested in exploring, then I think language becomes more of a barrier and, and Google Translate isn't necessarily going to help you in the same way because they're still in print more than they're online, I think. Mm -hmm. That, and that reminds me in some of the Canadian works, we're not even able to find um, critical editions at all, really. It's, um, you know, you have the notes on the page and, and that's the best you're going to do. And you, it's up to you to go find um, anything else to support uh, something mm -hmm. about the composer. I think it's yeah. particularly yeah, rich and uh, exciting and also frustrating if you're uh, just wanting <laughs> some answers. <Yeah. laughs> if you like to research, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Um, that might be the definition of research. <laughs> Exciting yeah. and frustrating at the same time. Do you have any tips for um, folks who are thinking about how to consider the accuracy of the scores that they're looking at or the commentary? That's a bit of a tricky one too. I mean, I think unless, good question, unless you are um, literally going to compare all the editions and, and look at the, you know, the autographs, the, the, the facsimiles and, and compared, you're going to really have to, there's always, there's always a certain reliance on the person who did it as having done their job uh, well and trusting in that. Uh, but having said that, I, I do have some thoughts, one of which is yeah, you can triangulate, by which I mean, um, you can look at other editions and see what their notes say. And and um, especially if you're, if it's a piece you're used to performing or thinking of performing, um, what that you're already quite familiar with, then you can kind of look at it and you should be able to scan it fairly easily. Um, another way would be to compare it against different recordings of the same piece, especially by, um, especially if you're interested in historically informed performances. And I'm reflecting on the fact that I most of what I've been studying historically is kind of pre-1800, so so that's more of a thing. Um, so you're relying on the performers to have done some research too. But um, even if you're not, that also works for bigger works. If you're not as familiar with reading like a full score of a symphony or something, then you can hear different groups performing, and that'll give you a better sense of of um, of what's been done, I think, and you can compare. A third aspect you might want to consider is age of age of publication, and this ties back again to the idea that as more research is done on different things, like this Albinoni thing, or uh, that I mentioned earlier, you're going to find that uh, attributions change, or knowing where something sits within a composer's whole catalog of output uh, changes as well. And it's important to get a sense of um, oh, so by looking at a more recent edition that'll have, if there's any new research related to that piece it'll come out in there in the critical mm -hmm. notes for there um which can be particularly helpful i think um to mm -hmm. to determine so even if you can't look at all their you should definitely read their critical notes but even if you have no basis to make that judgment by listening to others by reading other editions of it you'll have a better uh, at least a better perspective from which to know how much you can rely on it i think mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I find a library in library collections, music library collections, you'll often find scores of many different published in many different time periods because I think I think we're less likely to weed out the older editions because they still have I think sometimes a good performing value. That can be useful in in terms of like comparing different types of scores and seeing how they're laid out and the different uh, editorial comments, but it can also be a little misleading. Sometimes you, know, you find a score that's 100 years old and just because it's in the library collection doesn't necessarily mean that it's the most reliable score on the shelf. So yeah, no. it's a, yeah, but a, an interesting exercise to compare. Yeah, um, misattributions were common 100 years ago, I think of uh, Haydn works and Handel works particularly. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And even Bach versus his sons, uh, some of his sons, yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, Tim, for your time and chatting with me today. Did you have any last advice for 
students who are beginning to uh, search for music scores for their for their, totally. their own performances or or study. Talk to a librarian. <laughs> talk to Carolyn. Um, I mean, you can talk to other librarians too. But the but the point is, you really there's so many different. It's it's a bit of a um, minefield out there with different types of scores and different purposes. And I mean, a performer, as as Carolyn's talked about, um, needs a different type of score potentially than than someone who's doing a, an essay on a paper, uh, an essay on a on a particular piece. And I think it's really important to make sure that you um, you're just kind of matching what your goals are to the the edition you need. I think and um, and a performing edition isn't much help if you're trying to you know understand a larger. Uh, if the dynamic markings you're reading at aren't weren't the performing composers, we can't really read into that in the same way. Um, so being aware of, of these differences makes a huge can give you a huge advantage in the quality of the paper you write and the accuracy of the paper you you do. It's a great topic. Thanks, Tim, for your time. Um, and My pleasure. Yeah.